Hello and welcome to Access Chat. We're delighted to have two guests with us today. So we've got Catherine Holloway and Tim Adlin from the Global Disability Innovation Hub. Uh, been tracking this for a long time, um, aware of the, the work that you're doing. Um, I think it's very exciting to have you here um, because you're bringing on some of the stuff for the next generation and we're going to talk about that shortly. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit more about GDI Hub and yourselves and how you got into working in this space? If you want to go first, Catherine. Sure. Yeah, so um, I'm Cathy Holloway. I'm one of the founders of the Global Disability Innovation Hub alongside Vicky Austin, Ian McKinnon and Chris Holmes. And we set up GDI Hub because we realised the difference that the London 2012 Olympics and Paralympics made to disability in the UK and globally. Um, I had nothing to do with the Olympics, but I can now claim to have had something to do with the uh, Paralympics, not really. But Chris, Vicky and Ian all helped deliver the legacy programme, whilst I was beavering away doing assistive technology um, in, in the academic space. And as part of the legacy programme, University College London committed to building a new campus on the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park. And we were given the opportunity as academics for what should go into that space. And I was lucky enough to partner with the guys to come up with the idea of the Global Disability Innovation Hub. And we invited all of the partners that were moving to the park to join us. So our partners include Loughborough University London, the Royal College of Arts, uh, London College of Fashion, v &A, Sadler's Wells, and now the Smithsonian. So we've been, we, were, we launched in just before the Rio Olympics um, and we've grown steadily. We now, um, we are now in charge of a 20 million pound program for DFID to look for the Department for International Development, so UK aid, to look at how we make a difference in the assistive technology world. Um, and we're also leading a new master's program. And as part of that, that growth of GDI Hub, we've been very lucky to be joined by Tim and um, another lecturer called um, Yong Jun. But Tim, I wonder if you'd like to pick up on the MSc that we're launching, the MSc in Disability Design and Innovation, and say a bit about you. Okay, yes, so hi, I'm, I'm Tim Adlam and I'm an associate prof at, at GDI Hub. Um, and uh, so I'm helping to lead the new MSc that we have. I, I came into the hub um, after doing over 20 years of research and design in assistive technology and, and I'm a an engineer and a problem solver. And uh, the hub's a really exciting opportunity to take um, those and uh, International problem solvers. Oh, sorry. Is it, had, is it back again? Yeah. Yes, it's back now. Okay. Um, yeah. So maybe I'll, you could I'll, repeat what you said. Yeah. Tim, excuse us for interrupting, but there was some distortion. Okay. Um, hi. So I'm Tim Adlam. I'm uh, an engineer and an associate prof at the hub. And uh, I came into the hub quite recently in December after 20 years of working in assistive technology, engineering, and designing and researching different kinds of things for adults and children and people with dementia and all sorts of different things. Um, but this is an opportunity to, to take all that, take that work and, and uh, turn it to an international context and to the, you know, the 80 percent of disabled people that don't really have access to what they need. And uh, but I can't do all that on my own. GDI Hub, we can't do that on our own. And actually, we can have a lot more impact by training up um, a new breed of, of people who can work within this uh, very complex space and understand the big picture, people who are going to be able to lead um, new solutions and find new ways um, of, of solving the problems that, that many people face every day. So our new MSc is starting in uh, September this year, and uh, we're really looking forward to a really kind of diverse cohort of students joining us already. That sounds really exciting, and, and it's very well aligned with some of the stuff that we've been doing with my day job and my other hat on as the leader at Atos, is that we um, have been running apprenticeships on um, accessibility and assistive technology. So we've mm -hmm. been training up the cohorts of young people to come through uh, and learn about accessibility and supporting assistive tech. Um, in the workplace for our customers, for our employees, etc. And we're now working on the the next step, which is to create a national apprenticeship standard. So so we've got the so essentially we're getting the pipeline for you guys. Um, uh, hopefully building up people that are to a foundation degree level. Yeah. Um, and then you know hopefully what what we'll end up with over a period of time will be you know a clear career path. 
because one of the things that mm -hmm. that's required by the the National uh, Institute for Apprenticeships is it, you have to be seen as it being an occupation, and that's one mm -hmm. of the key hurdles mm -hmm. to overcome to get an, an apprenticeship standard uh, approved is that it has to be recognized as an occupational career and I think it's a great career you know it's kept a roof over my head for the last two decades and yours and Deborah's and so mm -hmm. on so mm -hmm. but but it, clearly there's a need for this to become a recognized profession and occupation and and something that 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 is understood by society so bravo for you know standing up the MSC it sounds really exciting yeah, I think there's um, there really is a need for training people of being able to understand and solve that kind of those complex interdisciplinary problems. And um, it's not just about being an engineer or being a clinician. Um, people may come from those backgrounds or come from those disciplines or come from those kind of interest areas. But um, we really need people who can work in, in that complex space and who are able to speak the language and communicate with people from lots of different contexts as well. Um, you know, I've, I've done multidisciplinary projects where it's taken us a year to under, for the partners to understand one another and be able to communicate the ideas that we're thinking about. And um, you know, I think an important part of the MSC is to equip people with the language that they need to be able to work with with, with different people. And, and if I if I can jump in as well, just to build on what you're saying, Tim. I think the other thing is that frequently some of these problems in different master's courses, which are excellent, but they're quite siloed. So they're either in the built environment or they're in uh, medical device technology or they're in digital or they're in social sciences. And so what our MSc does is cut across that. So we, we have design thinking as a core strand that, that runs through everything. But people will be learning about you know, the, the UN movement for, for people with disabilities, the, the social, the international um, the international development and social development aspects, as well as learning to do basic coding and making, and then applying those to real world problems. So I'm sure you guys have learned about it all the time, and Tim and I often reflect on this, but you know, you land, like when I first landed in Uganda doing some work in, in schools for visually impaired and, and hearing impaired children in Uganda, it's it's entirely different to anything else you've done before. And even if you've worked in Uganda for a long time, you suddenly go to a new bit of Uganda and, and it's completely different again. And so getting our students to have that confidence, it doesn't matter where they are in the world. They, they are also, they're part of the Global Disability Innovation Hub. They're part of that alumni. We are kind of a family, we're growing and, and we're building partnerships globally. And so they should feel supported in their ability to tackle these highly difficult and complex problems um, and be able to be a voice for equality uh, we see disability equality as being paramount to equality in society and it's and there are so many cross-cutting themes um which which we have to tackle within problems of of disability and, and assistive technology so we're really it's a really exciting project it's taken a, a lot of time to get off the ground um and one thing i wanted to say is it's been delivered not just by university college london but also with our partners at london college of fashion and loughborough university london and we just today, just if, if followers are interested, we got um, a studentship or like some a donation towards fees for an American student of twenty thousand um, dollars, which is from the UCL Alumni Association. Which, um, if so, if people are still wondering about what they want to do in September, and you you come from the United States of America, then we would love to speak to you. This is really amazing, and I've been watching. You know what I I, I heard about it. Um, really, sort of the first time um, at, this week at the United Nations COSP. I saw a lot of activity about it. So how delightful that you're our guest this week. But how can um, organizations like, um, Neil had mentioned what they're doing with apprentices and getting apprenticeships and getting people ready, which leaders like ATOS and Accenture is also doing some of the same things. It, you know, the corporations are not waiting. They're actually engaging yeah, and saying, yeah, yeah. we can help make sure people are ready to really fulfill the jobs that we have available now and in the future, which is exciting. And, and then you have IAAP, the International Association of Accessibility Professionals, that yeah. is still relatively new, that has some good mm -hmm. content that they can contribute. How do we all contribute content and support funding to make sure that you are successful and how do we open doors like I, I want to help in the United States and we're helping like the valuable 500 we're helping them in Latin America yeah. in the Middle East so because and just for a second I had people asking me when I was at the UN 
you know, is that how is the valuable 500 going to help us, for example, under Dr. Caroline Casey? And they said, you know, isn't this just a marketing campaign? I said, you're right. It is a marketing campaign, getting CEOs to the table and talking about this. And then we as the community and the industries behind it, we have to provide the right supports, the right training, the right, you know, innovations. The corporations have a play. We all have a part to play in this to make sure that as the corporations continue to say, all right, I buy it, I'll do it, how do I do it? Where are the talented and the qualified people with disabilities to do the jobs that I have today and tomorrow? So I threw a lot at you, but. You did, um, is it all right, Tim, I'll jump in first and then hand over mm, to sure. you to, to pick up the stuff that I um, forget. So there's a couple of ways that um, the community can help. So there's, we've got two big activities happening at the moment. One is um, AT 2030, which stands for Assistive Technology 2030, and that's about getting life-changing assistive technology to everybody. That has six core components at the moment. So one is developing research evidence and impact. Then there's Spark Innovation. There's one on community-led innovation. And then there's some market shaping, some stuff led by the WHO on, on standards. Um, but what we are really keen to do is, so for example, I'm here in Kenya at the moment. Partly we're doing research in informal settlements to understand what the barriers are to get assistive technologies. But we also launched our innovation, our first accelerator program here in Kenya. So we are working to create a kind of world-leading inclusive innovation ecosystem here in Nairobi, which will have a be a regional lead for assistive technology development, but also digital inclusiveness. Um, and so we're talking to people like Safaricom here, AMREF. We're hoping to have conversations with other, um, other companies. So we are looking for people to help with the development of the curriculum for, for, the, um, for the, the accelerator program. So for example, Ogilvy, we, we spoke to them just yesterday about how they could help with marketing for, our, for the successful candidates. We have one, one and a half million pounds to invest in assistive technology that will help low resource settings. So anything that any, if anybody wants to get involved and help grow this inclusive innovation ecosystem, we are open for partnerships and they can be anything. They can be big and small. I was talking to a very small charity about, you know, a very small project and then we're talking to the very big people about very big donations. But we will have a funding body. So if you've got money to invest in this area, you can join our funding board and, and we're, we're open to that. And then the second way, of course, is, um, we can also link in to provide evidence for some of the research that people are doing. So one of the biggest barriers to assistive technology adoption is, of course, the return on investment model. Everyone sees the cost of assistive technology and the, the benefits of the inclusive society are, are often lost. So we're working with the UCL Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose to look at how we how we change that and how we deliver a better return on investment model. And, and then um, and so then, of course, there's the MSc. So um, in terms of the MSc, projects are always good. Our students will love real life projects. Um, nobody likes working on theoretical rubbish. Um, so, so we want to work on, on real life projects. And, and so we'd, we'd be um, completely open to that. And, and to be honest with you, the way we've grown all of our partnerships with GDI Hub is that we've started small. We found that we, you know, we work with a partner on something that doesn't cost anybody any money. You know, they're, they're doing this bit of thing, we're doing that bit of thing. We collaborate on something that's quite small, quite time bound. We get to know each other, we see what works, then we, we figure out a funding mechanism for making it bigger. And sometimes that's people giving money to, it's like a studentship or scholarship or something that comes into GDI Hub. Sometimes it's us giving to the community, you know, it, it can depend. Um, so that's, I mean, that's how we've, we've done it so far. I don't know, Tim, if if that's your, if you agree with what I've said, or if you've got anything else to add. Yeah, I do. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's been organic growth and quite relational um, in the way things have happened. But I think just another thought about opportunities. We, you know, with our MSc, we're going to be um, building uh, every year a cohort of quite uniquely equipped people with some really great skills and some really good um, abilities. And it would be great to, if we could send them out to opportunities, um, that if people want to, uh, Make make use of these great people. Um, you know, we would we would be really glad to be able to send them to to interesting places to work and where they can gain further experience and where they can go and make impact. So, if people have got opportunities for our graduates, let us know about it. We we would be glad to help help with that. Now that 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 sounds like an exciting opportunity. Uh, I you know I've just been scanning over the 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 AT twenty thirty pages and it's something I was aware of already and um, props you've got one of my favourite people Suleiman Khan on <laughs> on your pages love Suleiman awesome. uh, yeah. yeah um 
AT is such a broad thing. Um, and people's <laughs> needs are very, very, very broad. You know, everybody's yeah. needs are unique. But there is this temptation um, to to say, oh, well, you know, we're going to make uh, assistive tech, you know, it's going to be just mainstream. Everything's going to be accessible everywhere, you know, no need to do specialist assistive tech. And I'm I'm a proponent of of wherever possible making mainstream tech accessible. But at the same time, we ought not to forget um, that that's not ever going to address the needs of a, mm -hmm. a cohort of society. So how are, how are you addressing that in the in the GDI hub? Because I think there is sometimes it's a little dangerous. We could we could we could think that we're going to solve all of the problems through mainstream tech, and we're not. No, and I agree with you. And I think um, by mainstream tech, generally that's that's profitable tech. And um, you know there are products for people with complex disabilities that are never going to be profitable because the volume to support the, the, a product of that complexity um, isn't going to be there, and people don't have the money necessarily to buy those. Um, so uh, yes, you're right. I mean, and absolutely, I am also a proponent of of of, a, of going to mainstream and making assistive technology a part of the spectrum of, of technology. Uh, we find it hard to define the details of what disability is, and, and assistive technology is defined by disability, um, which is why perhaps. Um, you know, we should be thinking about sexual technology as well as a sexual dis disability as well. So, how can we address that? I think, I think there are several ways of doing that. And um, so, we had a bit of a problem with your microphone again, Tim. Okay, so um, let's just go back. So yes, how how can we cross that spectrum of need and of volume as well? Um, so for example, um, we're doing some work around seating for children with very complex cerebral palsy. Those seats are going to be marginally profitable um, if they're only aimed at that at that particular population of children. Um, so we would be, you know, in that area, that's a very narrow specialised product. You'd probably be looking for government support for that or charitable support to enable that product to be made available at, a, at a, an affordable price. Um, so we have a product, uh, Designability, a charity that I also work for in Bath called WYSIBUG, um, and that's not funded in the UK. It's, it's suitable for a population of children, but it's not it's not a commercially viable product. We tried it commercially and it didn't work, but it is charitably funded. So I think um, there are options at the low volume end around looking at uh, a charitable pitch for uh, profit support, um, and obviously where we can government support as well. Then there's that middle space, which is the, I think the really interesting space where there's lots of there's room for some really interesting some innovation. Um, I think there we could be. There are some interesting hybrid models that are emerging, um, where we're looking at a combination of of, of a commercial and a not-for-profit or an altruistic um, provision simultaneously, and looking at a, an organisation or a structure where where the profit-making part of the organisation that's providing a mainstream profitable product is able to um, perhaps skim some of its profit to support a, a an altruistic. Um, more altruistically provided product as well, and there's an example like that is the Tom's shoes, which people have seen, where um, where they're manufacturing shoes for um, people with plenty of money, and also manufacturing shoes for people with, with um, not so much money as well. And I mean, they've now branched into other other things as well. Um, and, and I think that we could, there's room for some really interesting innovation within service and business model modelling there. And I think that, I mean, that's also part of our remit as hub as well, because we have to look at the whole problem. We can't just think about the technology and where things sit on that spectrum. We have to think about delivery as well and, and understand um, how those different components fit together. And then in the mainstream thing, well, we're trying to create great designers who can go and work in the mainstream and understand disability. They, they will have really sound design thinking skills and this, the people engagement skills that they have actually make them effective designers in any context. Um, whether it, whether they're designing expensive cars or whether they're designing wheelchairs. Um, and I think there's impact as people take their assistive technology skills and actually go and take those into uh, industry and into uh, mainstream work, then we'll, we will see things shift there as well. Great point. Um, we, 
we know that, that disability innovation often is a precursor to mainstream adoption of technology. We've seen it with speech. We've seen it mm. with uh, all kinds of, uh, you know, things like captioning that, that, that benefit everyone, um, but they were designed initially to, to benefit a, a smaller subset. Yeah. So I think definitely the, the, the other part that I'm really excited about is you're talking about service because, you know, you, you can have all of these products, you can have all of these features, but if you don't understand how you're going to deliver them to the customers or you're not aware of them because a lot of there's been a load of assistive tech built into technology for a long time but if people don't know about it they're never going to use it so that service element is really important to the, the understanding business yeah absolutely um if i could jump in here as well and be maybe a little bit controversial it's always good to be a bit controversial but the other thing is i think we need to find better models of the way that some of these um these non-profit making assistive technologies um, are funded better by by somebody, right? So, so we we currently have. So when I, I've been doing some work with Mariana Mazzucato, and obviously she leads and drives this whole idea of the value of everything, and looking at how like public sector entities like universities often come up with innovations, which are then brought to scale by corporate corporations, and the money never flows back into the the tax base of the country and, and you get a brain drain from the the public space and the only people that are perceived as not adding any value are government right so they don't add any value at all to anything um, but they do add value they can create the ecosystem where innovation can thrive and they can create the ecosystem where we are generating this inclusivity within an innovation um, and they, they can they can allow that to happen I think and so I think one of the things I'm really keen on is how do we, you know, we, you know Tim, you mentioned it right at the very beginning, but 80% of people don't have access to wheelchairs, eyeglasses, hearing aids. I mean, it's absolutely insane. We can put people on the moon and we can't get a wheelchair to somebody. Um, we can't then make a, a city accessible. So we need to, to really begin to, you know, obviously you guys in Access Chat are doing a great job of this, but it, the, the lobbying has to, to keep happening. And so the next generation of people have to, to keep happening. And I think it's worth noting, Deborah, you, you mentioned the UN agency, you know, you're at COSP, Conference of State Parties, this year. And I think a, a lot of credit has to go to the WHO and to Chapel Canapsis Gates team for getting assistive technology on the on the world record. You know, I was talking to Chapel uh, today and it, it's only five years old, Gate. I couldn't believe it. I hadn't, I'd forgotten, it's only five years old. And in five years, he's managed to get the priority assistive list and he's got the World Health Assembly to, to back getting a world report on assistive technology, but also like getting this into universal healthcare. And what I really loved about the call today, which is about how the, the um, report will be, be structured, is the fact that they're already looking at beyond healthcare. Yes, universal healthcare coverage is a really essential way of getting a lot of core, what I would call core assistive or priority assistive products to people. But we all know that some countries, for example, it will be funded through labor and social protection. Some countries, it will be funded through the Ministry of Education. But And also, you've got, as Tim's described, you've got these middle grounds. You've got the inclusive bit that Neil was talking about, the mainstream, but you've also got these middle grounds where they don't quite fit into what you get standardly and they don't quite fit into mainstream yet. And so I think I think that it's it's just worth acknowledging what, what the WHO have managed to do in, in this area, I think, um, and also the role in which I think now if we could bring together the disability activists with the aging activists, with the the um, corporates and the UN agencies together, and with all of us doing innovation and everything else in the middle and, and driving you make sure the users are at the center, we, we've got a chance to really, I think, disrupt the world a little bit. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm rambling. I'll hand back over to you, Neil. Great, thank you. Um, I think the really um, interesting thing and what I'm interested about is what you're talking about um, when you're talking about the, 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 the flow of funding and how we can deal with that. I've been thinking about sustainability and tying sustainability to accessibility. Mm. And we, 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 you know, inaccessibility is an externality. We treat it like pollution. We can yeah. then use the, the frameworks that we're using for pollution and carbon trading to find ways of funding 
that innovation, funding those things, because society benefits, but it's having a holistic framework within which to mm -hmm. do that. And that requires international cooperation, and that requires organizations like the UN and the World Health Organization, because otherwise you've got what you're talking about, which is the, the silos and the different societal models. You know, like you go to Germany, you get your assistive tech prescribed for you, you come to the UK, your company buys it, and you get some of the funding back through access to work. So, yeah, we need to find better and more joined up ways of doing this and also ways of measuring that exclusion. So I, I'm very interested in, in understanding externality reporting and finding ways that we can think about people being excluded and measure that as an externality and tie that to sustainability because then companies are going to be on the hook because they're, you know, their shareholders are demanding sustainability reporting, externality reporting. They're doing this through the DGSI and, and um, the, the global reporting indices, etc. So I think looking at these big picture things is, is important. And, um, and I know I'm going to stop because Antonio has got a question as well, but I thought, you know, I just wanted to address that point. I think the time is coming for this kind of thinking. Well, uh, Neil, uh, uh, this week I was at a, a public transport conference in Stockholm uh, with people from, uh, from governments, from private sector, and there was a big, re really big focus on sustainability and, and and public transport with no impact that is are able to make our scenes greener and is able to have improve the quality of life of city of citizens so there's a there's a, a very interesting alignment between sustainability improving the environment and at the same time making public transport accessible to everyone that needs to move you know people are aging so that's that it's it's very important to align these two topics at the same time I have to say that sometimes when I look at what what the UN doing, I think they should be talking at this type of events instead of being inside the UN in in, in in New York. They should get out of the house, go to events like this one, and talk there. Otherwise, they are just talking between themselves. I'm sorry. So may I, may I comment on that, Antonio? No, please do. So I, I think that um, I completely understand your point about, you know, the UN feeling like a, a, a kind of, you know, just a conference of state parties. It's like a big institution. And I went there for the first time and I was in awe, you know, I'm in the UN. What am I meant to do? But actually, when you start talking to people like Chapo Canapsis, for example, you you can tweet Chapo now. I guarantee he'll be on as soon as you want. Right. He will. He'll be at these events. Um, I think UNICEF are the same. There are many events. So I was at Nairobi Innovation Week, many, many events sponsored by UNICEF. But like the people are out there. I think that it's it's challenging because, well, there's, there's a couple of things. It's challenging because there's so many events. Um, and I think we do sometimes, despite ourselves, fall into silos. So if you do come from the city agenda, maybe all you might see there is UN Habitat. You don't see maybe the WHO. Or, but I think there is a, a shift. Um, my perception of working with UN agencies over the last few years is that there's a huge amount of collaboration interagency, and, and there's more and more looking at new financing models, looking at new ways of sharing things, looking at new ways of, of disseminating what happens and getting people in. So. Um, I, I think, you know, I'm not here to defend the UN, I don't work for the UN, but I, my perception is that it, they are changing, and, but they're, they're big institutions, so they're going to change slowly, right? They, they can't be as agile as, as, um, as maybe you can be. Um, yeah, um, I agree. agree. Go ahead, Tim. Yes, so just coming back a little bit, and actually we're talking about agility as well. One of the other factors that's, that's changing the the landscape around delivery at the moment, and I think this is just, we're only just beginning to see this, is around the revolution in manufacturing as well. Mm. And um, that's really changing the way and who holds the power in, in production and who holds the power in, in where, in making the money and, and being a resource and a value to the community. And I think there's, um, a, you know, with this is digital manufacturing. It's not just about 3D printing. There's, there are other other ways of making things as well. But this is about empowering people um, locally to make things that are right for them and are useful to their community. And it's shifting the ability to manufacture useful things from centralized, expensive, high, capitally intensive 
facilities into the local into local communities and it's also enabling personalization and specialization at the same time as well and i plus it's also simplifying the supply chains too which is another big problem with assistive technology is actually getting stuff to people and if we only have to ship raw materials now we only have to get plastics or wood or whatever the material is to people and then we can use those materials to make to make anything that people need where they are that that's of, of great value additionally i think the other opportunity there is is to create a resource for a community which can make wheelchairs or it can make crutches but it can also make bits for cars or bits for someone's kitchen or, or whatever else people happen to need and i think there's a well, we we with manufacturing and changing the way people think about what's made and where it's made, we can also start to change perhaps the perceptions of of um, of the role or lack of role of disabled people within society as well, and start to empower people, enable them to become a a resource and a contributor to their society and a and a point and a place to go to. Um, Antonia, you perhaps you have some thoughts on that. No, I, I've got, um, I've been uh, over the last uh, couple in the last two years very connected to manufacturing and in industry events and now tapping into to understand what the industry is doing but at the same time uh, identifying uh, groups who have certain interests and one of the groups that is very com that is very widespread is the make a community of makers you know people that uh, like to talk about internet of things uh, who organize meetups and talk how to develop products how to make them secure and these communities they exist all over the world who people who just want to create a, a, a piece of hardware to improve uh, uh, to, to improve uh, detection of the quality of air in one city. I think it will be very interesting if uh, people with accessibility are able to tap into the maker community. You know, and that goes precisely what to the, what you were saying about allowing people to be able to produce locally. I think there are they are a very a good opportunity if we try to engage with the maker community in order to bring them to this conversation about accessibility and, and inclusion. And I think this will be a topic that they would like, and I don't think it will be difficult to bring them into this side of things. Yeah, I, I, there's a, um, I was at a, the European Academy of Childhood Disability a few weeks ago, and uh, there's a great network in France of um, of uh, fab labs of, of maker facilities, um, which are which have been built and and situated within clinical spaces, and people with disabilities can go to find out what they need and work with a clinician, and there is an engineer that they can work with, and they can build their own stuff and make their own things. So it's not just about connecting the the maker community with a with people with disabilities, with disabled people. It's actually about merging those communities and equipping the people with disabled people to become the maker and to become um, the, the the producer in that context as well. So I mean, absolutely, and there's 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 lots of opportunity in in that space. So yeah, building on what Tim said, um, we as part of AT2030 will be doing a number of events to try and do two things. One is increase digital fluency around um, dis disabled people, people with disabilities. So it's well known that the World Economic Forum has, has stated that making skills and coding skills are they're, they're very much needed for 21st century jobs. They're not just about the hardcore skills of making and coding, but it's the problem solving. It's the fact that you tend to work in teams. You have to communicate what you did. You tend to, like, you know, go onto instructables or something and say, you know, how you how you did it. And and so we're looking here in Nairobi. It's a small part. So we have this. Um, it's called hashtag Innovate Now, which is the ecosystem that we're growing. And there's an accelerator program, which is the main thing, and there's a challenge fund. But we have a small amount of money for pipeline activities. So we'll be running an Enable Makeathon. Um, and then we'll also be running coding clubs and some, some other events through the Maker Space, um, uh, Maker Lab, Maker City Labs, Maker City and Fab Labs. The Fab Lab movement and the, the Nairobi is now a fab city. Um, is trying to be a fab city. So I don't know if you know about the fab city movement, but that's 50% of what a city produces should be made within the city. Um, so with that um, carbon hat on, which I fail miserably with the number of flights I do at the moment. Um, but the other thing is trying to grow that network. So we've been thinking about trying to write some accessibility guidelines for maker spaces. 
Um, not so much. So one of the things that happened in the on the Olympic Park as part of making the Paralympics and the Olympics accessible was there were guidelines which have just been reissued um, by one of our team, Ian McKinnon, who's co-director. Um, but there was also a strategy which Vicky led and and that strategy was all about how you include disabled people in the decision making process, how you set up structures to because you can't get everything right every time. Right? It's really difficult to make everything 100 percent easily accessible to absolutely everybody on the planet. But there is a process that you should go through to make sure that you have cons not consulted as in you've gone out and asked a few people, but people are part of that. Um, part of the decision making process. So what we'd like to do, and it's been on, it's been like one of those ideas that's been on the whiteboard for a long time and we've not yet activated it, but uh, maybe this can be the call to action to say if anybody wants to be involved, our idea had been to make it an open book, like an, an open platform that anyone could contribute to. So none of this academic authors, first author, last author, just people can contribute if they want to. It's a, a live document that where we're showing examples of how um, how we're making spaces and places and things more accessible so that disabled people can be a bigger part of the maker community. That sounds excellent and uh, obviously we're big fans of public participation in, in accessibility. Um, I, I also wanted to just go back a little step and when you're talking about all of the, the the stuff that you were talking about, you know, fab cities and doing stuff locally and 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 in, encouraging the the manufacture of assistive tech locally. We interviewed a chap called Howard Weinstein recently. He founded Solar Ear. And so that's a process where again People who are deaf uh, are manufacturing the hearing aids. They're using uh, components that they're they're buying in and they're manufacturing, and then they are on top of that um, making sure that they they have cheap batteries. And 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 it was the batteries in that particular case where uh, essentially um, you know the the bought-in hearing aids were were being given out and then people weren't able to use them as soon as the battery died because the cost of the battery was too great. So yeah. so yeah. things like that, um, the money is being plowed back into the community. So there we're seeing a real social ROI. Uh, I think that's really important. You know, there's, yes, mm -hmm. Ayudas Paratodos in, in Colombia, which is Felipe Betancourt, who's doing similar stuff, hacking accessibility using, you know, um, rice paddles and, and, and uh, normal mice to create foot mice and, and you know, plastic tubing to create um, desk razors and sharing the, the videos and the blueprints online to enable people to make it themselves. Those kind of things that I think are fantastically enabling. And then you've got things like Hack Access Dublin and, and other, um, you know, disability accessibility hacks that are, are springing up. And, and yes, we need to inject some of that into the, the mainstream stuff going on. Um, I'm interested to see how that momentum is going to continue to build, because I think it will, because I think the direction of travel is for stuff to be made more locally because of all of the things you mentioned around carbon, carbon footprint and, and everything else. How do you think the education process that you're enabling here will impact on that? And then I think we're probably going to close because we've run out of time, sadly. Um, go for it. So, uh, so, sorry, I, mean, I can comment, and, but I think one of the things, it's a tension at the moment within the assistive technology world um, about how we get products to scale. So how do we get reach this 80,000? So if you're going to produce 85 million wheelchairs, you know, are you going to drive down unit costs in China and ship? Or are you going to try and be more innovative? And, and what do you do in the short term versus the medium versus the long term? Um, and one of the things that AT2030 is doing is experimenting with new models. And then there's another, which you might have heard of, Deborah, uh, at the UN COSP, which is AT Scale, which will then try and scale some of these initiatives. And of course, AT Scale are doing mar far more about market shaping that's happening um, now, but in terms of our um, master's course, we'll be drawing on all of this. So we'll be looking at full product lifestyle, life cycle, but also, as Tim mentioned before, the service models. So a lot can be done differently. When we were in Norway recently, um, we're looking at the Norwegian model, which is all based on the human rights. You know, it's built into their law. It's, it's human rights for them to have an assistive technology. Anybody has an assistive technology. 
for an average people of 3.2 devices, wheelchair user, you've got one with skis on, you've got one for outdoors, you've got one for indoors. That's, that's your human right. But it's a library model. Nobody owns their assistive technology. It, it is returned when you no longer need it. So I think there's, there's ways of looking at both the service, the financing, the recycling, how we, how we look at that, that full product um, life cycle, and also how we, you know, our master students will also learn from you know, the AT scale approach of this market shaping the current market, but also the new innovation approach of how do we manufacture locally and, and, and what do we do there? And, and they will be able to see how their product or service might fit now and how they might be able to evolve into, you know, a different road in maybe five to ten years. That makes good sense. Tim, did you just want to, did you have a comment on that before we close? Um, like yes, about? I mean, I, th I think there's there's a new movement um, that's happening all around us in in assistive technology and in disability, and unlike in previous decades, it's it's taking a much more holistic approach, and it's looking at the, the person's needs, it's looking at delivery, it's looking at service models, it's looking at how to make things um, technologically and economically sustainable. And I am I am really optimistic that there's going to be some change, and I think um, it, there are very many. Uh, bright, intelligent, um, creative people who are really interested in solving problems in this space. And uh, I think they're going to change the world in the future. I'm looking forward to see it happen. Particularly as I'm, I'm really probably going to be needing it at some point anyway. Wait, I was about to say, <laughs> and I'm really excited because the 80, 20, 30 model looks right the way across the piece. So they'll get that whole picture from market shaping right the way through to innovation. Fantastic. It's yeah. been enlightening talking to you both. I'm sure we're going to continue conversations, but for now, um, thank you very much. Uh, we look forward to you joining us on Twitter on, on Tuesday, and we need to thank our supporters, Barclays Access, MyClearText, and Microlink for helping us keep the lights on and sustaining this. So thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having us. Thank Thanks. Brilliant, brilliant efforts. There we go.